the press conference, uh, which is the first press conference after the uh, successful completion of the Asia Europe People's Forum in Vantian. Um, we've had many presentations here, and we just would like to stress to you the context uh, which we've come here, the context we've been working, and also uh, why we think that the Asia Europe People's Forum is important uh, both for the participants here but also for people who are not able to be here as well. Um, we are a network of, of citizens and people who sometimes are excluded from their citizenship in different countries across Asia and Europe. And at the current moments we have come together very sincerely because of the uh, growing economic challenges and uh, many people are facing across Asia and Europe, but also that is in the context of uh, uh, challenges which we call quite simply crises, which are not just economic. Uh, they are affecting areas of the climate, of people's lives and livelihoods on a daily basis, but also uh, issues of uh, food and uh, range of areas which we call multiple crises. They're interlinked, they are part of a whole, and uh, the way they link together we feel is fundamentally important. So it's not a question of uh, becoming experts or trying to make proposals just for issues around the financial sector or climate change or food and food security or sovereignty. You see the, the interlinkages are fundamentally important in looking towards solutions, alternatives, and also a different direction that we hope uh, our economic system and also our decision making uh, of our governments will make to take us away from a package of actions and issues which put too much emphasis on the power of the market without being influenced and control of the state for the benefit of citizens. Uh, too much emphasis on the power and the influence of what we call transnational or global companies at the expense of the interests of the majority of people, citizens of uh, many countries we're coming from, and also put too much emphasis on enabling, in my country we call the financial sector, uh, the large financial services sector, which has been central uh, to the economic and financial and food and climate crises that we are facing at present. I come from a country where over one trillion numbers are too big and make little sense uh, when you just have them as numbers. One trillion pounds, one and a half trillion dollars, uh, one hundred, one thousand five hundred million. No, one thousand one hundred billion dollars, if you're right, was put, made available for the financial service sector in my country. But Eighteen months after that, the, the Minister of Finance in our country made an announcement that half a million, half a million public sector jobs would be lost. Half a million. Now, for any country that is significant, that for half a million public sector workers tend to be in health work, in education work, in local government work. And so we feel in our country that the, the effect of the decisions made in the financial sector are affecting today, as we speak, the, the futures, the lives and the livelihoods of millions of people who are excluded from uh, access to services on a daily basis. Now that is an example of one country and why the response to the financial, so-called financial crisis affects our access, my access, my family, my neighbours, access to health, education, and lives and livelihood. I have been made unemployed by this crisis as a result of this situation. So we wish strongly to learn and listen listen and learn from other people in other countries who are also experiencing challenges due to the economic crisis. Some of those are in Europe, of course, we share many of the same challenges. But also we have seen across Asia the issue of 
growth without jobs, of uh, a change in the pattern of economic investment services. <coughs> We've gathered here in Vanchan to discuss, debate, but also to learn from each other and to hear what people feel from communities, from rural areas in different countries, from cities, from the poor areas of cities, from women, from men, from children, from people with disabilities on what they see as the potential alternatives, how they can see their lives improving and how they can feel we can all here begin to contribute to a more just and equal world, because that is our commitment. But the forum itself is a, a privileged opportunity for people to share, to people to learn, to people to exchange, and to people to look forward and discuss how their strategies can contribute to that more just and equal world. So we're not here just to talk, we're here to contribute to change, people-centered change, and to better justice. Um, the forum has just closed and we, are, we feel uh, that it has been a significant achievement and also a significant success. Why? Many people, over a thousand, we estimate, came sometime for the whole event and sometime for different parts of the event. We had speakers and source people from many countries. We heard people from different parts of Laos share their experiences. We explored how issues interlink and also we came away with a final declaration which begins to try and capture some of the areas of we have discussed and some of the visions we have for the future. It's been debated, it's been contributed to and it's been shared and we hope that people will go away from here uh, with it as an inspiration for their future work and activities. We're also very uh, very happy and that it's uh, uh, very appropriate that the Vice Foreign Minister was here at the closing ceremony of our forum to, on behalf of the now people and government, but also on behalf uh, of ASEM as now is the host country, to receive the declaration, the final declaration of Asian European People's Forum. Um, strongly welcomed his presence, we strongly welcomed his receipt is receiving of the Asia People's Forum 9 final declaration. And we sincerely hope and believe that he will do his sincere best to communicate the content and the passion and the urgency of the, uh, the, 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 the words and the ideas and the recommendations of the final declaration uh, as he and uh, his fellow uh, representatives of the Lao government prepare, uh, interacting with representatives of ASEM conference for the forum, for the summit, and also uh, as the summit approaches, we sincerely hope, see if there can be some ideas, some visions, and some recommendations incorporated into the final declaration chair statement of ASEM 9. We will then continue to engage with our governments across Asia and Europe to try and ensure that the words of uh, our final declaration become translated into practice on a day-to-day -day basis and policy in our countries. Um, and thank you very much for coming here today and look forward to you also uh, talking about our vision and our recommendations. Thank you. I'm Mary Ann Manan. I'm a program officer with uh, Focus on the Global South. It's a development uh, policy research and advocacy NGO that's based um, in Bangkok, Thailand, but we have country programs in the Philippines um, and in India. And um, I would like to bring one of the key issues uh, that we have discussed in the last uh, few days here uh, at the AAPF9, and that is the important issue of water. Um, so the conclusion from one of the workshops that we um, we organized, and even in one of uh, one of the key thematics of the AEPF nine, is that water is an important, very important issue. It's an it's an issue for everyone. 
and basically you need it for your everyday needs, for drinking, for taking bath, and well, humans are made out of water essentially. And in the words of one of the Lao participants, they need it for their happiness. So, but apart from that, there are three key issues and key uh, points that we want to get across in terms of the whole issue of water. And that one, we are facing a severe global water crisis in terms of availability of the resource, in terms of supply, in terms of competing demands, and sus the sustainability of the resource. Even the United Nations claim that because of climate change or the climate crisis, it has completely affected the hydrological or the water cycle, and it might come to a point where it can be um, um, irreparable. But we're seeing not only in Asia, but also in Europe, periods of severe droughts in China, in India, in the Philippines, um, even in Spain and other countries where it's normally unusual because you have the um, additional effect of climate change. But apart from this water scarcity crisis, there is another crisis that is equally important to highlight which is the crisis of the development model of water governance, which unfortunately has transformed water from a common good that everyone should enjoy into a commodity and a tradable economic good, which unfortunately already exacerbates existing and equal access to water in different parts of the world, and especially in, in Asia. Um, and we're seeing different forms of what we call as quote unquote water grabbing where as what Andy said, uh, corporations have taken over water resources as well as services and have basically uh, controlled them for their own use. And I give you a, a, a couple of examples, a few examples of this. One of them is the dominant model of privatization of water services. We had examples from India, from um, from uh, from Jakarta from, and from the Philippines, where in the privatization of the water service or the, the, control, the transfer of the control from the government to the private sector has led not to efficiency in terms of delivering the water service, but more an equal access, especially for the marginalized and the poor. So in terms of social protection and universal access, the private sector has not really proven to be better than the public sector or the state. The second one, which is a, a very alarming in terms of new uh, water grabbing forms, and I think you can attest here in the Mekong, is large-scale irrigation projects such as dams, which is being built across um, Asia and, uh, and Europe. And in fact, in the Mekong, we have about 12 mega, mega, mega hydropower dams, which is being built and causing a lot of um, in, um, in access and impacts particularly to, um, to agriculture and to fisher folks. And the last one is new forms, and I, I'm, I'm not sure if you've heard of this, but it's called hydrological fracking, fracturing or fracking in short, wherein um, gas is being extracted or conventional gas is being extracted uh, from rock formation and it has become very risky in terms of um, uh, affecting water pollution and other, uh, other contamination in the water aquifers. But apart from but apart from this crisis, what the participants of the AEPF9 emphasize is that there is actually alternatives that are out there. Not only in forms of ideas, but also in practical and implementable programs. And one of this is the example of democratic, just and socially uh, sustainable uh, water management models, such as, for example, public-public partnerships, which is quite opposite to what um, what others say as, as the more uh, dominant form of, of a partnership, which is public-private partnership. But this public-public partnership essentially are not for-profit partnerships between various sectors, but particularly from uh, between a public water corporation trade unions and civil society where it, they exchange technical information, financial information to be able to improve public service um, for, for everyone. And this has worked. And you can, um, you can you, we have examples in the region, for example, in Thailand, in Bangkok, which provides about 
uh, more to more than a, a million of citizens in Thailand, and it, it has really worked. And finally, we would like to emphasize uh, three key chat demands that came out uh, of, of the workshop. Is that one, um, the participants highlight that we need governments um, need to uphold and implement the UN Human Right to Water and Sanitation, which was already adopted um, in the, by the UN General Assembly in 2010. Unfortunately, only 27 Asian countries have adopted this resolution. I'm not sure if Laos is actually one of those countries. But we need to emphasize that governments must be very, very serious in terms of achieving this right to water and sanitation. Um, the second point is to put a stop and moratorium on all forms of privatization of services, as well as of resources. And we join in solidarity the calls of our um, friends and comrades from Europe, particularly with the austerity measure being pushed by the European Commission to, um, uh, to privatize um, basic services such as water as part of their austerity packages. Um, and lastly, we want to promote uh, governments, to promote um, support and ensure an enabling environment through either policies and projects for the support of alternative forms of democratic, people-centered, and um, just uh, uh, water management models. And we can give a lot of examples, and we can do this through a constructive engagement with, um, with governments. Um, and finally, uh, just to end with a quote, um, which basically sums up uh, the water uh, issue. There is an English saying that says, that says water, uh, whiskey is for drinking, but uh, water is uh, for fighting over. And I think um, in the last few years, it has characterized the many around water. But we, um, as part of civil society, social movements, and activists, are already proposing alternative forms that can ensure um, water for all, uh, for especially for the marginalized and the poor, and that we hope that um, not only the Lao government, but also um, our government in, in Asia and Europe will listen to our plea. Um, thank you very much. I'm from Portugal. I'm part of a political left-wing party in Portugal, and also of the Red Audit campaign that is going on uh, in Portugal as well as other countries in Europe. I think we, being all the social movements, organizations, all the citizens that join together uh, in this forum, we all agree from the discussions we had that the, that the austerity policies, the liberalization policies, and the attack on labor's rights that is going now uh, in Europe, that is going on now in Europe, will only bring poverty and disaster into our continent in exactly the same way that these policies brought poverty and disaster into several Asian countries. We agreed that without stopping with this austerity, that without finding a way to deal with the public debt, we won't have any room for a, st a sustainable recovery of Europe, which means for policies that can uh, give back to workers in Europe their rights, that can give back to workers in Europe their jobs, their salaries, and that can give back to Europe a path of a sustainable growth that respects its people and respects its environment. And therefore, based on this, we recommend, or I would say we demand, that um, our governments break up with all the memorandums that they have signed with Troika, and by Troika I mean the IMF, the European Central Bank, and the European Commission, we demand that our governments break up with the fiscal treaty that was signed uh, in the context of the European Commission. We demand the end of the, all the austerity policies that are going on in Europe, and we demand new ways to restructure our public debt. Only by doing this, we can find new ways to finance our countries away from the financial markets. Euro bonds, the European Central Bank buying uh, debts directly to our countries. We need to stop being dependent on the financial markets that speculate on our debts. We need public investment capable of creating jobs, cap capable of creating a growth model or development model that respects the environment and it respects the people. We need to find policies that can find precarious jobs and can restore not only the salaries, but also the dignity of all, our, all workers in Europe 
and we're losing their dignity with the last years of austerity and attack on trade unions and on labor rights. I think we, we still agree or we agree that uh, we all believe that another world is possible and another Europe is possible. We have the alternatives, we have the policies, and we have the desire to discuss it in a more democratic way. I believe that after this forum, we are all one step closer to achieve this other world and achieve this other Europe. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Vaishali Pagli, and I'm coming from India. I'm an anti-nuclear activist from India. As in Asia Europe People's Forum, we are launching in the entire Asia Europe Initiative against nuclear power and nuclear weapon. After Chernobyl, Three Mile, Three Mile Island, and all the more after Fukushima's nuclear energy accident, no one can really deny the danger of nuclear power in projects to humanity and to our planet. We appeal to Asia and EU government to phase out all the nuclear projects like the German government has done. We also appeal to stop producing and eliminating completely all kinds of nuclear weapons in Asia and Europe. At present, in the background of economic crisis, it's completely unacceptable to continue investing into the nuclear energy and weapon industry. When other side, the million of the people are struggling from poverty, hunger, and really struggling to survive. We, as a Asia Europe Anti Nuclear Initiative, uh, uh, which in the workshop we discuss and have come to the conclusion that the renewable energy has proven to be more cheaper and safer than fossil fuel and the nuclear power. So we have passed certain resolutions and have decided to launch a two programs uh, in our workshops. I would like to also share uh, with all of you the, our first program, we have of our Asia European Initiative against the nuclear power and nuclear weapon, is going to pressure and denounce the Indian government for the repression against the anti-nuclear activists in India. We are also organizing the visit of various countries parliamentary, parliamentarian to visit Kudankulam and Jaitapur proposed nuclear power project uh, to show the solidarity with the grassroots anti-nuclear movement. It is basically to avoid another Fukushima in India. As you all must be aware that in India, in Kudankulam, that is in Tamil Nadu state, thousands of the villagers, more than 10,000 villagers, have been booked under the Sedation Act, Sedation Office. So precisely for that, uh, we thought of organizing the visit of the parliamentarian from the various countries to show a solidarity with the anti-nuclear movement in India, that is especially in Kudankulam and in Jaitapur. Thank you very much. Thank you so much from here. I think uh, the crisis has been anticipated, has been predicted, is happening. And I think it will continue because the lack of action. It's good that we discussed that before, uh, but what is really urgently needed is the action. By action, I don't mean you know, movement of, of uh, big events. But we should start with ourselves. We should learn to live simply consume the minimum for survival. Be mindful of what you take, how much carbon uh, dioxide is committed to produce the product, <coughs> consuming or using. When you take trips, and you recognize that, you know, how much carbon emission are you contributing. So I think the power should be in the consumer's hand. We are becoming the victim of our own weakness by uh, complying to the commercialization, to the lifestyle that is, we know that's not sustainable. So, let's, I think, just do or be the things that you want to see. Like, Gandhi says, you know, be the change you want to see. 
I think unless we do this, what we talk about is going to continue to be so. And this is not the first time that we have a global crisis or crisis of this proportion. And it seems like they're not able to really learn. So my question is, are we really the smartest animal on the planet? The smartest animal will not self-destruct. And so we are contributing. All the things that are taking place is so connected. Even this building of uh, power plant that is highly risky is publicly owned. The shareholders spread all over the place. So that's how things work. So unless we stop consuming, and I mean say completely, but we do stop consumption, therefore we would have influence on the uh, corporation that grows on our consumption. If it cannot grow, that's the only time, that's the only way we can really reduce that influence. And uh, government is desperate to really provide jobs for its citizens. The only partner in, in receive is the, the private sector. And the private sector is to maximize profit. That's given the bank is to make profit. Everything said clearly that's what they are doing. All the nations are all for self-interest. So here just to have to practice and to practice I think we need to educate ourselves in a more sustainable way. Right now education is actually in a way dumbing us down because it's not promoting thinking very much. It's not promote connecting very much. It's one for the self. The egoistic approach to life. I'm sorry a bit more philosophical, but unless we go down to the root of the problem, we're not going to be able to solve it. Humans, we thought we were smart, right? But we spend all our time working so hard at the expense of our own health and the health of the planet. To make money. And then later we spend all our money to recuperate the health, our own health, as well as the health of the planet. Is that smart? We are so worried about the future, so worried about the problem of somebody else, we never look inside ourselves what we should be doing. So we continue to live not in the present. And we actually we have to accept the reality that someday we just have to pass away, become partly organic and partly chemical. So we should Learn to live, not live. To life is out there. Live. That's what I meant to say.